Hey, today's show is brought to you by Audible. Audible is a audiobook subscription service that you can get 30 days for free by going to our link, audibletrial.com slash musicalswithcheese. And you can browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a title free and start listening. It's that easy. Uh, just go to audibletrial.com slash musicalswithcheese. I repeat, audibletrial.com slash musicals with cheese. All right, let's get on to the actual show. Hello, I'm Jesse McAnally. And I'm Andrew DeWolf. And welcome to Musicals with Cheese, a podcast where I try to get Andrew to like musical theater. How are you today, Andrew? I am doing very well. How are you doing, Jess? You know what? I am just not great. And why is that, Jess? I'm just enjoying my day, and then I hear a house falls out of the blue and lands on my sister. And then some little brat comes and steals the shoes right off her corpse. You know, Jess, that sounds wonderful. I'm just curious. What musical did we take a look at this week? Uh, I believe we watched the uh, the classic film Wizard of Oz this week, I, if I remember correctly. Oh, no, 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 no. Andrew, you did that on your own. We're actually covering um, Stephen Schwartz's Wicked. Wicked? Oh, man, I'm totally unprepared for this. I didn't watch it. Oh, no. No one mourns the wicked. No one cries. They won't return. No one lays a lily on their grave. The good man scorns the wicked. So Wicked is a Broadway musical with music and lyrics by Stephen Schwartz and a book by Winnie Holtzman. It is based on the 1995 Gregory Maguire novel Wicked, The Life and Times of the Wicked Witch of the West, a retelling of the 1939 MGM film The Wizard of Oz. The musical is told from the perspective of the witches in the land of Oz. Its plot begins before and continues after Dorothy Gale's arrival in Oz from Kansas. It includes several references to the 1939 film and Baum's novel. Wicked tells the story of two unlikely friends, Alphaba, the Wicked Witch of the West, and Galinda, who later changes her name to Glinda the Good Witch, who struggle through opposing personalities and viewpoints, rivalry over the same love interest, reactions to the wizard's corrupt government, and ultimately, Alphaba's public fall from grace. So, Wicked premiered on Broadway at the Gershwin Theater in October of 2003, after completing a pre-Broadway tryouts at San Francisco's Quran Theater in May-June of 2003. Its original stars included Adina Menzel as Elphaba, Kristen Chenoweth as Glinda, and Joel Grey as The Wizard. The original Broadway production won three Tonys and six Drama Desk Awards, while its original cast album received a Grammy. And Wicked officially surpassed the $1 billion it dollar mark in total in Broadway revenue, joining both Phantom of the Opera and The Lion King as the only Broadway shows to ever do so. In July of 2017, Wicked surpassed the Phantom of the Opera as Broadway's second highest grossing show, trailing only The Lion King. So it's got a lot of popularity behind it. Um, yeah, I think it's one of the more famous Broadway... Like, when you think Broadway, you think Wicked. Yeah, people say Wicked, uh... Uh, surprisingly, I really hadn't heard very much of the music from this or knew much of the plot at all. So I was kind of uh, surprised by some of it going into it. So I'm curious, Andrew, as someone that walked into this with your only connection to this really being uh, twisted, um, what are your general thoughts of it as soon, like walking out? Because you pretty much just watched this. It's it's a it's very interesting. The music is very good, obviously. Um, not going to say anything bad about the music because it's fantastic. The plot is a little more fan fiction-y than I was expecting, to be honest. Um, it wasn't bad, but uh, it certainly doesn't... Like, with Twisted, I almost I almost consider that canon now. <laughs> Whereas with Wicked, I feel like I can't... I, I won't go back and watch Wizard of Oz and be thinking about this. Uh, I'll be like, well, that's something else entirely. <laughs> You know? Now, why do you think you have that disconnection? And since Wicked's come out in 2003, there have been a ton of ripoffs of it, including, like, Maleficent and Twisted, of course. Like, how do you feel this holds up compared to those? Well, I think this holds up fine. It's just, uh, like, it feels more like uh, a fan fiction, like, like I said. Like, I think what it is is that the tone of it is so different from... Uh, 
from The Wizard of Oz, where The Wizard of Oz, everything is, like, magical and whimsical. But this one, it's like they're going to school. It's like, <laughs> you know, it, it's not, it doesn't feel the same. I mean, it's still very much magical, and, like, they try very hard to keep that Oz tone by, like, adding crazy wordings of it, like, Glindify or Splendiferous and stuff like that. It's 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 like Harry Potter compared to, like, Lord of the Rings or something. I, I don't know. Like, one of them is, like, clinical, and the other is not. <laughs> like, the use of magic in, in Wizard of Oz is, like, fucking weird and random, and it doesn't really make much sense. Whereas the use of magic in this is, like, something that there's professors for, and, like, it's very established, uh, and it it's understood. You know, I never thought about the Harry Potter influence on this until you brought it up, but now I'm starting to see it a bit more. Yeah, I mean, that's just something I noticed. And I'm not saying this as, like, this is bad, I don't like it because of this. I'm saying that it's just, it's different from what I expected. Because I expected it to be more like, here's the Wizard of Oz story, but this is why the witch was the good guy. You know, something like that. Whereas it's more it's more like a, here's my fan fiction of Wizard of Oz. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but I like that element of it because it, it, I consider Wicked to be the most perfect Broadway idea there probably has been in a while because it's dark enough that you can be an adult and enjoy like the darker, more mature elements. It has the foot in the childlike elements by having the connection to the Wizard of Oz. No matter what, at least in America, you can walk into this and have a general idea of that's the Wicked Witch of the West and that's Glinda and that's all I need to know. You don't need to like yeah, yeah. read a book, you don't need to like have like an understanding of what Devin, Evan Hansen is or see Spongebob. You have that, but it's also a brand new story. It's not like Frozen the musical where it's just Frozen again, but on stage. It's a brand new story, but things I already know are connected to it. Yeah, like it's not something like it's using a property for for publicity purposes, kind of. And also for story purposes, but it's not it's not doing something ridiculous like remaking the 2002 Spider-Man movie into a musical or something like that. Uh, it's it's a little more original than that. Why would you bring that up? That's that's not that's not relevant right now. Oh, it's not relevant at all. Okay. I mean, that doesn't make it wouldn't make sense anyway. That doesn't exist. Yeah, that would never so. do that. <laughs> so, Andrew, since you're talking so much about the story and how it feels fan fiction-y, do you want to go through it really quickly without bringing up any of the songs, just, like, hitting every basic beats? Let's just talk about the story all together. All right, all right. Yeah, I'm, I'm down. Let's do it. I want to start in the opening prologue, because I kind of... That opening is one of the few flaws I I have with the show, and it's mostly just positive uphill from there. What's your issue with it? It's messy. And it's trying to get a lot of plot at you at once. And it feels very, very contrived and very, very, like, shoehorned in. Like, hello, people. Let me tell you the story of this person that just died very vaguely so that you guys know it. But also the audience knows it because it'll be important later. To be honest, I think it was unnecessary, too. It's like we really didn't need to know... Like, oh, she was born green. Like, I, I could kind of guess that, you know? <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, I like the funeral. Like, I love the idea of No One Mourns the Wicked, that opening, like, parallel with Ding Dong, the Witch is Dead. Like, it's their own version of that. And I like that idea, and yeah. I think we could just go into that, and then she they could go back in time, and we don't need the flashback to her mom cheating on her father with a man. Like, we don't need all that information, and the fact that we have it makes it feel a little bit less sturdy of an opening, and you really need that opening to draw us in. Yeah, I think that would have been... I think I agree with you. It would have been fine without the flashbacks, and it... I don't think the flashbacks draw it back too much. Like, it's fine, but it does feel a little bit like, gotta get all this story out quick, come on. <laughs> and it's just to set up a twist that's really dumb. 
Yeah, the, the twist is super weak. So this guy uh, comes in and has sex with Elphaba's mom and impregnates pregnates her with Elphaba after making her drink basically a green elixir. That's why they, that's why she's green. And that's why she's green. Yep. Um, and then we immediately flash back in time to their school days, and we realize that Glinda and Elphaba, who is the Witch of the West, do not get along. Elphaba has a sister who is paraplegic, and her father does not like Elphaba much and dotes on the paraplegic daughter. The the whole sister in the wheelchair thing, I, I, I thought that was kind of odd. I didn't really get the point of it. Um, I do. I, I'll get to that one it comes up in Act 2, but we'll talk about it. Okay, if that's, that's what you, how you feel. I feel that way, because, I mean, for one, it's that way in the book, and you can't really fuck with the book too much when it adapts. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. <laughs> and for two, it helped them out for legal reasons. Legal reasons? Yeah, there's a lot of... With the Wizard of Oz story, there's a lot of specific legal ramifications. Like, the actual... L. Frank Baum books are in the public domain, but there are elements of the MGM film that MGM still owns, like the specific shade of green that the Wicked Witch can be, and the wart on her chin, and the ruby slippers. All of those things are owned by MGM. Like, no other... F- <laughs> Without permission, no one, no other property can use those. So, why didn't they just get permission? Um, because they thought of a workaround that was clever. That's fair, Jess. That's fair. And I think that workaround worked pretty well. But we'll bring that up later. So, Alphaba um, accidentally does magic, and old, old lady says, Madame Morrible is like, yo, that, that's impressive. We could meet you up with a wizard. And that's Alphaba's goal throughout the rest of Act 1, is to meet the wizard. Was that her goal before she came to the school, or was was it literally just because the professor wanted her to? Well, she never thought it was a possibility until the professor said, "This is a this is what you can do." She thought she was too green. Ah, ah. I mean, to be honest, it's not easy being green. You know. I mean, I can't imagine it would be. I had to I had to blow my joke on that one already. Fuck me. <laughs> I could have saved that for something better. Yeah. But let's skip ahead a bit, because not much story-wise happens um, until Elphaba meets her professor, Dr. Dillamond, who is a goat man thing, who is a very well-spoken goat man. Yeah, when he can talk. Yes, and there is a political movement in Oz trying to get the animals' um, rights removed and stop them from speaking. And somehow that works. I guess if if they just don't talk for a certain period of time, they just forget how to. It's weird, but that's fine. Maybe it's maybe it's contamination in the water or something. The wizard's just pouring his green elixir into the water. Spoilers. What the fuck is that, anyways? I don't know. Green elixir. In the book, it was a little bit more date rapey. <laughs> what the fuck could be in that? That turns kids green. Food coloring? I don't know. <laughs> food coloring? <laughs> they just didn't scrub her hard enough. Oh, no. They could have just come right off. They're just like, ah, fuck it. But he's afraid he's going to lose his voice and lose his rights, and Alphaba's like, I'll tell the wizard about this. This is a very important thing. Yeah, Alphaba joins PETA. I mean, she's already kind of the vice president of PETA, let's be honest. Well, she's not killing as many animals, but... Yeah. And then Elphaba is going back to... <laughs> going back to... Yeah. <laughs> I don't have enough information to comment on that, so we're moving on. We're moving on. So on her way back to her dorm room, she runs into this new character named Fierro. Fierro's the guy that uh, sings how about how he doesn't like school. Yeah, he's the Prince of the Winkies, I think is what they call him. What? <laughs> is that what they called him? Um, I don't think they ever called How him, they... but he is a Winky, which is like, you know, the guys outside of, in the original Wizard of Oz that go, oh, ew, oh, oh, those guys? Yeah. Yeah, those are the Winkies. Yes. Those are the Winkies. And he pretty much rules over them. That's his, like, domain. God damn, this show, it's just not weird enough to be a Wizard of Oz. <laughs> He's just like a normal dude. He, and he's like, oh, yeah, he's actually a winky. 
Just letting you guys know. He is a Winky. Oh, okay. I didn't realize he was a Winky. That makes more sense now. That's fucking. That's why when she, he sends Alphaba to the castle in Act Two, that's why she has all those guards because that's Fiero, the king of the Winkies' castle. Why would why would those guards protect her? Because their master told them to. Don't they respect the wizard over him? I mean, is the wizard king of the Winkies? He's king of the whole fucking place. No, he's just a <laughs> wizard. The wonderful, he's a wonderful wizard. But Fiero comes in and basically convinces everyone, hey, just jerk off the rest of your life. You know, your life don't mean nothing. He kind of changes his tune on that really fast. But the important thing about this song is Alphaba and Glinda become friends over the fact that Glinda was kind of a jerk about something and then makes up for it. I mean, she was just a, she was being a jerk and then she didn't. Like, Alphaba didn't realize it. <laughs> like, it's pretty much what happened. And then she felt bad about it because Alphaba was nice. So, I, I think we all know who's the fair weather friend in this uh, relationship. And then they have a conversation that night. Um, and Alphaba reveals that because of her being green, her mother chewed a bunch of, like flowers that made Nessa come out premature and fucked up her leg, so now she's paraplegic, so her dad bl- hates her for being green and forcing her mom to be paraple- her sister to be paraplegic and killing her mom. Oh my god. <laughs> We're off to see <laughs> the really, wizard! It, it was like a, that was like a really heavy scene that I didn't really understand because they were talking about how she like had to chew I forget what they even called it. It was like fla- white seed flowers or something like that. Yeah, so it was something like that. And it's like, I didn't really understand that that was what made her... I thought they were like twins or something, and and she broke her legs on the way out. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> no, it was... Um, she's a second child, and her mother did like these like risky druggy things, and it fucked her up. I'm surprised that a lot of handy capable foundations haven't come out about against a show about how ableist it is. I mean, they they're saying that it's a bad thing that she's paraplegic, which I would say it is a bad thing that she's paraplegic. Yes, but it doesn't mean you can't have an equally fulfilled life. What I'm saying is you have very few roles on a stage show for actors that happen to have the paraplegic disability. Um and then you have this one Including yes. this one. This one does not and count. And that's kind of... That bothers me. <laughs> I like, you haven't written the script and a she's... paraplegic person can't even play the role. The, the weird thing is, though, like, the paraplegic thing, it just doesn't even feel like it's that plot relevant. Like, it doesn't even really need to be there. Like, it's it's just, like, it's kind of just pointless. It's, like, other other than them trying to get around whatever Lego... I, I don't know how it even helps them get around that, but... And it might be a really inappropriate joke about how... When the Wicked Witch of the East, East feats get like all atrophy and sucked into the house again, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even think of that. <laughs> which oh would be God. horrible. Which Jess, would be really horrible. Jess, I didn't even think of that. Thank you for making that joke. <laughs> it's not even a joke, though. It was just a possible idea of what they were thinking about. Alphaba and Fiero share a moment when they both save a lion cub from their cat from their classroom from being taken in captivity after Dr. Dilm and the goat man get fired. And then somehow that lion cub. We'll figure that out later. Don't worry about that. But then Alphaba and Fiero have a moment and they're like, oh, I want to bang you. But they keep it in their brain. Nice. Nice. My wife. (laughs) All right. Very nice. (laughs) So Madame Morrible comes up to Alphaba and says, hey, you're about to go see the wizard. <coughs> and Alphaba's like, oh, I'm so excited. I want to see the wizard. And Glinda's like, can I come? And she's like, yeah, come with me. And they go to the Emerald City. <laughs> it didn't take them nearly as long because they rode a train. Why didn't Dorothy ride the train? Who knows? Because the munchkins told her to take the road. No, Glinda told her to take the road. I mean, to be fair, the wizard built that road specifically for the munchkins. They don't have any rights. That's why they don't get a train. They get a road. 
Maybe if uh, Dorothy chose to land in a richer part of Oz, she would have been able to take the train. So they go, and they meet the wizard, and he's got this giant wizard head, and as soon as he realizes, oh no, it's Elphaba, the girl with the magic powers, he comes out and reveals what a dorky old man he is. I love the wizard in this. Really? Yeah, he's great. Why? Especially the big head he has. Just the design of the big head, or him as a character? The design of the big head is fantastic, and I think I've always just liked the wizard. He's just such a pathetic dude. And I've always been a big fan of pathetic men. Is that why you hang out with me? Of course. And (laughs) myself. (laughs) Um, The wizard gives Elphaba one of the magic spell books. And she's able to read it. No one else is. Oh my god. So remarkable. I don't understand how that works. But yeah, I guess being green. (laughs) No, she's a person of both worlds. Are they implying that the magic comes from our world? Because there's really no magic here. I imagine it's like when we go on to other, like the Superman rule, like he's a normal guy on his planet, but when he comes to Earth because of like the different properties of Earth, like he seems super But the wizard isn't actually a wizard, though. The wizard can't do any magic, and he's actually from here, so. Yeah, that's fair. So basically they're saying that only half, only people that are half uh, us and half Oz are magic. Halflings, yeah. Also, I, I mean, probably being green also helps, I would assume. The green gives her the power. Kermit the Frog kind of magic. <laughs> she realizes that the wizard's the one making all the animals not able to talk, and she gets mad, and she and Glinda run away, and Glinda's like, why are you doing this? Why can't you just, like, go along with it? Uh, well, uh, okay, well, I, I have some issues with the wizard's plan. All right. What the fuck is the wizard's plan? Um... It's Bush era politics, which is you, everyone needs a good enemy. Yeah, but like, needs a good enemy from what? I'm gonna build the what wall, the and the animals are gonna facing? pay for it. What were the issues that Oz was facing that he needed to create an enemy for them? Well, if you create an enemy, they won't rise up against you. I get that part. Yeah, but why were they gonna rise up against him? It seems like most of them, most people like him. I don't know. Imagine you're in a place where you got someone with a below average IQ running everything, and he's relatively charming, and he's southern, and he's just running things, and then he's like, oh, they're gonna catch on to me pretty quick. Might as well blame a bunch of, like, specific uh, minorities for a giant specific thing so that all my people will turn on them, and we can start this war that's still going on today. But the animals didn't do anything wrong. Neither did Iraq, but we still invaded them. (laughs) All right, so Alphaba decides, you know what? I don't want to work for this fucking wizard of Oz, this W of Oz. And she's like, fuck this shit. Um, I'm going to go fly to the Western skies. Her and Alphaba split up and act one ends with Alphaba deciding I'm going to be evil now. Also Galinda. Oh, Glinda changed her name to Glinda because, you know, reasons. Glenn or Glinda? Glenn or Glinda. Oh, Glinda? Glinda or Galinda. <laughs> it's the newest Ed Hold the strings! Yeah, I'm, I'm not too... Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not too big a fan of the name Galinda versus Glinda. They're kind of the same thing. <laughs> Act 2 begins and... Glinda is like a politician. She's pulling off her best Ava Perone, and the entirety of the world is like against Alphaba. And Fiero's like, I don't want to deal with this bullshit, and he kind of runs off. And then we cut to Alphaba visiting her sister, Paraplegia Reno, Nessa Rose. Paraplegia Reno? <laughs> that's, that's, I think I got that from the Simpsons movie. So Alphaba comes to beg Nessa Rose's help. She says, no, you've never done anything for me. And here's where you get the clever part. Because in Act 1, Elphaba and Nessa Rose's father gave Nessa some silver slippers. Just like in the book. Elphaba does a spell to help Nessa Rose walk. Which also makes the slippers feel like they're red hot or on fire. So they do a lighting effect where they make them really hot looking ruby. So the shoes are never 
ruby slippers themselves, but you can do lighting on silver slippers to make them appear like ruby slippers. That is the dumbest shit I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> Welcome to our legal system, fellas. But it worked. It worked storytelling-wise. Yeah, except for when Dorothy puts her puts them on, her feet aren't hot, are they? They keep it vague enough that you're assuming it could work. Ah, yeah. And then, then the sister's able to read from the book, though. Oh, I'm just assuming she was just able to, like, kind of gleam it, like, get the generalities of it. And with that, her husband and a former high school lover, Bach, who's, like, desperately in love with Glinda, and always has been, comes in, he's like, I'm leaving you, I'm gonna go chase after Glinda, and Nesta's like, fuck you, I'm gonna make your heart disappear. And she does a spell to make <laughs> his heart disappear. Oops, it's gone. And Alpha's like, you can't fucking undo a spell, you dumb wench. Yeah, so then he gets turned into a Tin Man. And that's one of the best reveals in the entire show. Really? I think it was kind of dumb. I thought, I didn't see it coming on first watch, and I was like, what? what? Well, I didn't, I didn't see it coming, but it's dumb. <laughs> Why is it dumb? Well, why the fuck would she... Like, I always just thought the Tin Man was just some dude that lived that lived in Oz. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, it's it, no, it's a munchkin that got turned into the Tin Man because they had to. I think that's not far off from what happened in the book. Because what happened in the book was, um, you have this woodsman, I think he was a munchkin as well, whose axe was enchanted, and it would just start chopping off bits of his body, and he'd have to replace <laughs> it with tin. Until he was finally just all a tin person and he couldn't love his wife anymore. I mean, that is a pretty cool story, though. Mm-hmm. I would make a great musical. Possibly one that we might do in the near future. Is that from the Oz books or from the Wicked book? That's from the Oz books. Well, I don't know much about the Oz books, but from the movie, I just thought he was just some dude that was chilling. Well, the thing is, the musical Wicked kind of treats the movie as gospel even throwing reference to it, which I think is a smart move to make if you're trying to sell this to a mass-produced audience, because, like, you and I, casual viewers, and most people, are mostly aware of the film. So you want to keep the witch green and all that other stuff. Keep it as close to the film as you can legally. <laughs> I think the, uh, the issue I have and where it feels fan fiction... So so fan fiction oh, oftentimes they'll have this thing where like the main character of the fan fiction like they're it directly involved with every aspect of the plot. It's like so basically this the way this story explains it the the witch directly creates basically every character in the Wizard of Oz. Yep. <laughs> so it's like okay. <laughs> Uh, so I, I, that's where I think it gets like a really fan fiction feel. It's like, this feels like something from fanfiction.net. Uh, the witch is just someone's uh, self-insert character. <laughs> well, she's not perfect. She makes mistakes. She's not a Mary Sue in any no, way. I'm no, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying Mary Sue. Uh, did not claim that. I'm just saying, like, this is the character who is behind everything. You just didn't know it. <laughs> It's like, oh, my! this is my, my new Star Trek fan fiction. This character is named uh, Andrew, and he, <laughs> he actually, he brought the whole crew together. <laughs> <laughs> yep, Captain Picard, uh, welcome to the Enterprise. <laughs> that, that's not correct. Like, all right. That, that is wrong. <laughs> if, I don't give a shit. <laughs> like, I don't know much about Star Trek, but I know that's wrong. I don't care. I'm just, I'm just saying... That having the witch be directly involved with the backstory of every character did not feel necessary to me and kind of drew me out of the story a little bit. <laughs> Which is fair. Like, she, like, especially the lion thing where it, like, it, like, comes back and it's like, oh, the lion was the lion she saved earlier. It's like, why? <laughs> is there no other lions? To tie back the animal speaking thing. But that that lion didn't talk, and the lion, the the cowardly lion, does talk. Yeah, but it was baby. Like babies don't talk either. Yeah, but why would the wizard teach it how to talk if it doesn't want them to talk? Because he was released into the wild. Even when you meet the lion in the film, he's like in the wild. No, oh, whatever. <laughs> All right. It's just, it's just so it doesn't make much sense. So 
Madame Morrible decides, you know what, we need to set a trap for Elphaba. Let me cause a tornado to come and kill her sister. Yeah. And all the munchkins cheer because their horrible mayor, self-appointed mayor, is finally dead. Did they create a tornado on Earth to kill the sister? I think so. How did she have the power to do that? Because she controls the weather, and that's her only magic power. They, like, set that up. They, like, she controls the weather in both worlds? I think so. Okay. That's very impressive. So Alphaba, of course, comes to her site, and we get that scene from the movie where her and Glinda had that issue. And Glinda and Alphaba are fighting because Alphaba stole Glinda's man, Fiero. Yeah. And then Dorothy's house gets towed away because she parked at a handicap spot. <laughs> hey, I've been, I was saving that one. I was waiting for a good time to use that. <laughs> you get that was it? Good. That was good, right? I was, really hope the audience yeah. gets that. I don't want to assume they're dumb. <laughs> <laughs> but think about I, I, it I for think it's a, a good second. Joke. And, then, and then laugh. I think, I think it was a good joke. Elphaba and Glinda have a cat fight, which I think is really dumb, and it hurts me a little bit to see, like, oh, these two characters who were characters on their own are now just fighting over a guy. He's hot. Yeah, and then he comes in, saves the day, and lets Elphaba run away, and they're like, let's beat the shit out of him until he tells us where she went. Let's, let's hang him up on a stick and beat him until he dies or he tells us where she's gone. Yep, but actually he's a scarecrow. Yeah, Elphaba casts a spell so he doesn't feel pain and if they stab him and hurt him he won't feel it and his bones won't break and all that by turning him into a scarecrow, but we don't find that out until later. And then he develops some very epic dance moves uh, <laughs> and a very he's very good at acting and pretending <laughs> that he's a, a completely different character in front of Dorothy and uh, all those. Do you think Bach knew the Scarecrow was Fiero, or Fiero knew that Bach was the Tin Man when they met? I I don't know. Do you think he knew that the lion was the one that he freed? I don't think so, but that's, like, relevant. Like, it could be any lion. Do you think that he knew that he had to keep it a secret from Dorothy of who he was, or, like... I mean, once, once you start thinking about it, like, he's the Scarecrow, and then you watch The Wizard of Oz, it's like... This is... So this is that guy? <laughs> <laughs> It's a really He's very good at acting. <laughs> I mean, they set it up like he says, like, I'm brainless or life's more painless when you're brainless. And he's very good at dancing. Yeah. Which is great. I mean, they set up like he um, is pretty impressive dancer and dancing through life. He does like dancing. So at least that's set up. He does. Dancing is set up. You know what isn't set up, though? Dorothy had already started walking down the yellow brick road, right? And then they hung him up in the town next to her house. How the fuck did she run into him? Maybe they dumped him further down the road and they took the train. So they had to bring him to the train, take the train, go back to the yellow brick road, put him down in the field, and then start beating him. You never know, sir. It doesn't make sense, Jess. It doesn't make sense. You know what? You should write the book writers and tell them that. I'm going to tell them, hey, guys, you got you got to have this scene take place in a different location. Then, so it makes any sense. My thought is Dorothy got got lost. Dorothy got lost on the way on her way down the yellow brick road and had to turn back. She had to take a dump in the woods. The sc- <laughs> that's how she found the scarecrow. She's like, hmm. There's only one road, but I don't know which way to go. I mean, there are forks in the road. They do set that up in the film. Like, there are several several different ways down the yellow brick road where you can go one way or the other. Did you know there's also a red brick road? I, I, I learned about that at one point. That goes to Kmart. Where does it actually go? I think it actually does go somewhere. It does go somewhere. I don't know. I think it go, might go to Ozma's place. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. There's like a map of Oz or something. It's like it's like watching it's like it's like looking at a, a Lord of the Rings map and like trying to make sense of it. Do you want to know the most messed up thing that happens in the Wizard of Oz books? What's that? Okay, y- you've never seen Return to Oz, right? No. All right, so they have this princess character named Ozma who goes missing. 
Yeah. And she's like, super important. And then we have this little boy character who we follow throughout the entire story. He meets all the characters, the wizard, all the scarecrow, TikTok, all of them. And by the end, they're like, hey, little boy, you're actually a girl. You're Ozma. What? <laughs> That's awesome. And they're like, we're going to have to turn you back into Ozma so we can have our kingdom back. And he's like, what? I kind of want to be what I am right now. And they're like, you're still what you are, but you're just going to be a girl. And I'm just reading this as a kid. I'm like, what the fuck am I reading? It was published a little too early. It's, it's the wrong kind of cringy. And there's a reason why only the first book is the one that got made into like the most memorable movie. All right. All right, little boy. You're going to be a girl now. What? It wraps up with Elphaba pretending to die and being on the lam for the rest of her life and everyone just assuming she's dead and her finally running off with Fiero and Glinda and Elphaba being separated for life. And it's a kind of bittersweet ending. I- I'm going to say that's a bad ending. Really? I mean, in terms of... Well, nothing good happens. Literally, it's like the worst possible ending. At least Elphaba's alive. It might have been better if she was dead. In the book, she dies. She's dating a scarecrow. She's dating a scarecrow. So? What's wrong with that? Dude, they're made of straw. He's not going to be able to get hard for her. Yeah, but he'll be the best cuddler. Oh, yeah, he'll be a great cuddler. It's a fucking weeaboo's wet dream. (laughs) A living living pillow. I'll name you Senpai Scarecrow. Yeah, and then, uh... (laughs) And then Galinda is in charge, and, uh, I mean... I, I hate to say it, but she's kind of a bimbo the whole fucking the whole fucking yes, show. Yes, but right? she says at the end like, that she's gonna try to be Glinda the Good. Trying doesn't cut it in fucking politics. <laughs> Does she solve the animal issue or no? Does she have enough of a backbone to do that? Does she care enough to do that? Does she actually disagree with the wizard's politics, or was, is she only pretending to disagree because her friend did? Her friend who she thinks is dead, by the way. Does Glinda have any ideas of her own or, like, strong morals of her own? No. I guess it is a it is perfect Bush-era politics. It really is, you get rid of You get rid of Bush, and then you get a spineless uh, guy who does nothing in office. Fuck you. <laughs> fuck <laughs> you, man. Why would you go fuck yourself? Glinda killed um, Osama Bin Laden. Um, Glinda allowed there to be marriage equality between humans and animals. Glinda created free health care throughout everyone, or at least affordable health care. Did she? Yes, yeah, she did. <laughs> so how okay. did you get off Glinda's dick? She tried her best closed, um, close to close, um, Goatonimo Bay. She tried really hard. So very, very hard. But you know what? She had, um... A Wizardian Senate, and she couldn't get much passed, even with executive orders. Welcome to our politics show. <laughs> Actually, if we go by the books, Fallen Glinda should be the Scarecrow's regime as king. Well, it's fucking Rise of the Winkies. Let's go. I mean, he is a brainless, like, orange person running, so. Rise of the Winkies, my boys. We are going to get rid of the munchkins, and they're going to pay for it. guys sorry to interrupt you in the middle of the show but we're here to shill at you it's time to shill baby i'm mm-hmm. in today's show is brought to you by audible audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day free trial membership just go to audibletrial.com slash musicals with cheese and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs download a tile f- Download a title free and start listening it's that easy go to audible.com slash musicals with cheese to get started today what book do you recommend, Jess? Are you reading anything? Are you listening to anything? A good book that's on Audible is actually Wicked, The Life and Times of the Wicked Witch of the West by Gregory Maguire, narrated by John McDowell. Well, that's a really weird book to recommend in this episode. Yeah, it really makes no sense. But you know what? Audible content includes an unmatched selection of audiobooks, audio, original audio shows, news, comedy, and more from the leading audiobook publishers, broadcasters, and entertainers. Well, I guess if you don't want to read Wicked, which, I mean, I don't know why you wouldn't want to do that, um, you could read something else. But if you read Wicked, you get to find out whether or not Alphaba has a green vagina. Fun fact. Um, that's Is that actually in the book? Yes, it is. 
Okay. Does she? But wait, I don't want to spoil it for them. <laughs> to download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash musicals with cheese. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash musicals with cheese for your free audiobook. Excellent. That Great job, Schilling. Uh, have, a, have a great day. Yeah, let's get back to the show, kids. Oh, no. opening number i mean we talked about it a little bit but it's entitled no one mourns the wicked i think it's a good song i think you already mentioned some of your complaints with it story-wise but uh i think the song itself is very good i think it's a brilliant turn on the ding dong the wicked witch is dead which is a classic one of my favorites and I think it's like surprisingly dark. Like the opening notes of bum 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 are like so thrilling. And when you hear it live, it's like throws you to the back of the room. Well, I think it's fitting since when it opens, uh it's like after all the shit has hit the fan already, right? Mm-hmm. This is this is after the fact, so but what do you think of just the general idea and conceit of the song and all the story? Do you think it's done well? Like, it reminds me a lot of Bells of Notre Dame, which is also done by Stephen Schwartz. I think that this type of opening number is really good. You want to have, like, something that's uh, very intriguing. So it's just like... And, and this does the trick where it's like, oh, this is in the future, so you got to see how this happened, basically. So I think it's it's a very ear-catching... And really draws you in, so. And I love the darker sound to it as well. Yeah, I feel like we don't get to this level of operatic darkness, like, really throughout the entire show until maybe, like, No Good Deed. If it really ever gets back to that. it It's close, but never quite gets to this level of, like, impressive bitterness. Like, this is a very bitter opening number. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Such high esteem. When people see me, they will scream. For half of us is favorite team. The wizard of the land. Oh, the wizard of the land. You want to talk about the wizard and I? Boy, howdy, would I like to talk about the wizard and me? I. So, did you actually hear the connection? Like, we mentioned this previously in our Dear Evan Hansen video um or podcast about how this sounds a lot like um waving through a window i didn't really catch it i wasn't listening for it though was the thing like i i really wanted to just enjoy this as it's on its own and not try to compare it to dear heaven hansen Obviously. although i will say that the the style of pretty much all of the music in this is similar to dear heaven hansen Obviously, that's not something this did. That's Dear Evan Hansen ripping it off, but... Uh. <laughs> well, the thing about this is this feels a little bit more theatrical, where Dear Evan Hansen feels more popish. I think that might be the subject matter, though. Well, I don't remember any guitars really being used in this show. There definitely is. Can't think of any of them. Maybe it's just not in the forefront. No, there's nothing in the form front, but they definitely... I mean, I remember hearing some, like, electric guitar sounds. All right. But what do you think about The Wizard and I in context? I think it's one of the better I Want songs, because it's very clear and very... It builds very well. I like it because it's about the wizard. <laughs> um, it's about how she wants to be with the wizard, which I do as well. Um, no, I, I think it's. I think it is just really well... Uh, it's it's hard to describe how good something is without just repeating yourself, if you know what I'm saying. I get that. And I think, like, there's some clever, like, double play lyrics where it's playing with what we already know about the show. Like, when she's like, I know one day there will be a celebration throughout Oz that's all to do with me. Where, yeah, you're technically right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they did already show that happening. And so. I think that's very clever. Very clever. It's not, I mean, it's not, like, super clever. It's, but it's something that, like, 
it's it's something you appreciate that they mm-hmm. did <laughs> instead of just having it be kind of a you know straight really straightforward with no wordplay or anything like that mm-hmm and also, it really amplifies the voice of the singers that perform it. Like, it, it's a belty song, and it is compelling. Like, it's just one actress on stage throughout this entire thing, and you have to follow her through it, and that's really hard a lot of the time, because not all stage shows can pull that off. And most of the time, the actresses, with thanks to like the instrumentals and all that, pull it off. I think it was very good and one of the better songs in the show. Um, let's talk about something bad. to anyone with pause. Something bad is happening in Oz. Something bad happening in Oz. Under the surface, behind the scenes, something bad. <laughs> Sorry. Bad. Dr. Dylan. All right. Let's chat about something bad. A song between Alphaba and her teacher, Dr. Dillamond. I think it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think it was intentionally funny or accidentally funny? I, I feel like it's intentionally funny, I think. I mean, you don't write in a bunch of goat sounds and have it not be funny on purpose, I think. Well, I think that... It starts out funny, and the fact that it happens like three to four times, um, by the fourth time, it's like, oh, maybe this isn't funny. No, it was still funny. (laughs) Yes, but it's also supposed to be like a serious plot point. Yeah, but it's funny. (laughs) Do you like the song? Do you like this song? It's a nothing song. It's a plot song plot song he doesn't like it because it's a plot song it's a do you like how it sounds jesse not really <laughs> what do you think of the song like i know you think it's funny but what do you think of like how it i sounds? didn't like it that much see it's not like <laughs> it's not a memorable <laughs> song it's like when you think of wicked the first like oh my favorite is something bad uh something bad <laughs> it's no a- like the only thing memorable about it is that like, you've got the plot element where, like, I've heard of this Oxford professor from Fox that's no longer permitted to teach. He's lost all power of speech. Like, ah, this is important. You need need to remember this. Gonna be popular. I'll teach you the proper poise when you talk to boys. Little ways to flirt and flounce. Ooh, I'll show you what shoes to wear, how to fix your hair. Everything that really counts to be popular. Uh, you know that I'm popular. All right, let's talk about popular. This song was on the radio a lot, wasn't it? Um, they turned it into a pop song, which also very much bothers me. Yeah, I, like, I distinctly remember hearing this song a lot, and I was like, that's from this show? Yeah. And this is, like, every, like, one of my friend's favorite songs from this show. It's like, oh, it's so funny, and I'm an out, and I... I don't dislike the song. Like, when I watch it, I'm like, oh, I'm charmed by the actresses, and, like, this scene works, but I'm like... I don't like it that much. I'll be honest, it's like my only my least favorite in the whole show. Okay, well, one, I've heard it on the radio before, and anything that I've heard on the radio is probably not something I'm going to have a positive impression on. Okay. Uh, and then, on top of that, the style of it is, like, different than everything else. It feels like it's... Well, it might be because I'm thinking of it as a pop song. It just feels like a pop song. I think the the issue is that I've I heard the song before I've seen the show. So it's hard for me to think about it in a plot context. I'm just thinking of it as like, this is a pop song that's in this show. If that makes sense. It makes sense. But it fits the character. Like, I have a hard time shitting on it in the way that you do. Like, I don't actively like it, but it does fit the character. It does fit her attitude and mood. And it doesn't feel out of place in what we've set up previously. Yeah, but they shouldn't have made it into a pop song. I can't critique the show itself or something that happened outside of it afterward, if that makes sense. It hurts my impression of it, though, because I have I think, and a lot of other people may have, uh, their first time hearing the song may have been on the radio, sung by a pop singer. <laughs> Some Miranda. It reminds me of a uh, fucking Fiddler on the Roof, that one song. If I Were a Rich Man? Yeah. If I were a rich girl. Do you think that that sh- song is ruined for you because you've heard it previously? 
you know, I will say it wasn't totally ruined because the style is very different in the show. Um, whereas this one, it almost feels like exactly the same song. I actually, I was, I was kind of wondering throughout it if they actually just took the, if like the actual cast recording became popular on the radio or something. Like I wasn't sure if it was a different thing or not. Of course, I don't listen to the song that often, so I don't remember it. But it was a while ago that it became popular. End of Act One with Defying Gravity. Very good. This is it's a very good song. I love the song. I like it. I love the song <laughs> so much. It is such an effective end to Act One, and it bothers me that I don't like it as much as I used to. And why is that? Because Frozen happened. <laughs> what did Frozen do? Okay, so the original Broadway cast of this show had Adina Menzel. And it la- who later went on to play um, Elsa in Frozen. She was the original Elphaba. And Let It Go is very much a pastiche on Defying Gravity. Well, I mean, yeah, but there's plenty of songs that sound similar to each other. Yes, but it sounds similar while having the same exact actress. <laughs> okay. So every time I hear I... Defying Gravity, I can't help but... I can't separate it from Let It Go in my head anymore. Let it go, let it go. Is that you telling me what to do, or is that you just singing? Yeah, you need to fucking let it go, Jess. It's fine. Okay? At least it's not the same exact song in a different movie. I agree. I agree. (laughs) I mean, as much as I shit on it for that reason, like when it's like nobody in all of Oz, no wizard that there is or was, is ever gonna bring me down. Every time that happens, let it go. I get the shivers down my back. <laughs> shivers <laughs> down my fucking back, man. And then, then she starts singing, "Let it go." <sighs> no, no, she doesn't. But. It sounds so incredible, and I do love this song in its way, but I feel like over time it has been a little cheapened. Well, I think with a song like this where it's like, um, I almost want to come up with a word for it. They're like, they're like power songs. Power ballads? Yeah, kind of a power ballad kind of thing, where it's like there's only a couple chords, uh, and it's like very, very catchy. They never have a long shelf life, though. Like, you'll really... With these type of songs, it's designed that you really like it right away, but if you listen to it over and over and over again, you'll just start to be like, it just doesn't have the same effect on me anymore, you know? Mm-hmm. But the staging and everything... Like, this song really works its best in the context of this story. Like, a lot of people have sung it in, like, their reviews or in their cabaret shows and it doesn't work it only works if you are the character elf but you're green and you're flying in the fucking air singing about how you're gonna be evil now yeah and and honestly i wouldn't want to be overexposed to it because you i think it will lose its touch like generally songs that have more longevity are the ones that you kind of like when you first hear them and each time you listen to it, you notice something about it, and you like it more and more. If you like something right away when you first hear it, it's probably not going to have a huge lifespan for you. <laughs> if you can hum it right away, like as soon as you're done listening, you are not going to love that song in about ten listens. Yeah, that's why like, Sondheim just... holds up. Yeah, it's one of it's like it's a good song, but I'm not going to be listening to it in a month. You know, right. <laughs> But if I see the show and I hear it, I'll be like, yeah, it's good. <laughs> Cause it feels wonderful. They think I'm wonderful. Hey, look who's wonderful. This corn fed hick who said it might be keen to build a town of green and a wonderful road and yellow. Green. All right, you want to talk about wonderful? I'd love to talk about Wonderful. All right, let's talk about Wonderful. 
I like this song a lot. <laughs> All right. This song has never had an impression on me, negative or positive. So I'm just going to let you go and talk. I really like this song. I, I don't know. It's like, um, <laughs> it's, it's one of those songs where the guy comes out and he starts singing and you just know he's going to dance. And I'm just waiting for him to start dancing. And then he does. And I love that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> what? You know, he's like, it's like, it leads up to it. It's like, he's going to dance. He's going to dance. He's going to dance. Then he dances. And I think that that's fantastic. Um, and I would call this my one of my favorite cheese songs that we've listened to so far. What other songs in our repertoire have, would you consider a cheese song? Um, well, you got like uh, you got "Step in Time," mm-hmm. uh, is is pretty pretty cheese. Uh, it, it, most of the stuff from like the Muppets. <laughs> uh, I don't know. We haven't done many shows that have like a, a good cheese song in them. You wouldn't uh, consider "To Life" uh, from Fiddler on the Roof a cheese song? No, nope, that one was one. Yes, that one was one as well. Um, in She Loves Me, there was the, the waiter song, which I, that was a bad cheese song, but that was a cheese song. Um, so th- I, I like these type of songs and I also, I, I, as I said, I like the wizard. Uh, <laughs> um, and I like his, uh, I like his little rant about how everything is just what we decide to call it later on pretty much like history is decided by the victors kind of thing. I like that. Yeah, I don't have much to say about the song. It's a good pastiche on old-timey themes. There you go. (laughs) All right, we can move on. As long as you're mine, the love song between Fiero and Alphaba. I can't say I remember too much about this one. I really like this song, like, only because they didn't go the easy way in writing it. How do you mean? Like, if you listen to it, it's got that percussive, like, deep drum beat, like, ba ba da 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 from No One Knows, No One Mourns Him Wicked. Yeah. And it just sounds dark, depressing, and, like, disturbing a little bit. Despite it being a love song. Well, I think the reason for that is because that their relationship seems doomed, essentially. I mean, they are, but right? they aren't. Well, she has a plan, but... Like, it feels... Like, you don't get many dark love songs in musical theater. Like, songs that sound really kind of... Like, low... Like, like intense, but low timbre. Yeah, I get what you're saying. And this one stands out to me as, like, just one I like because it's... And it's also Alphaba just embracing it, and you you haven't seen a good thing really happen to her in this entire show. And she gets the guy, and she's like, you know what, I don't give a fuck that I stole this. I, I deserve something good for once. It's not easy being green. Exactly. What do you think of this song? I know you, don't, you say you don't remember it crazy much, but... To be honest, like I can't, I can't give an opinion in good in good faith here because I can't. To be totally honest, I can't remember too much about it. Um, then I'll add the opinion. Tay Diggs say, sings this song really terribly. All right, next song. Let all laws be agreed. I'm wicked through and through since I cannot succeed. Fiero saving you, I promise no good deed. Um, no good deed. Um, what do you think of that song? Like, that one's very. That was like really an intense one. I love that song. I think this is my favorite song of the show. I'm trying to remember if this is like mixed in with the part where she's like speaking nonsense words. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I like this one. Uh, although the nonsense words. If you didn't have that, it wouldn't be the Wizard of Oz. True. Very true. But you like how intense it is. Yeah, I like the intensity of it, uh, and it seems to really fit the moment that they're going with, so mm-hmm. I think that is a good, it's definitely a good good song. And it's nice to have her finally be like, you know what, fuck it, 
I'm tired of being the nice person. I mean, she already did that before with Defying Gravity. Yeah, but this one is more like you actually feel the losses. Like, her sister's dead. She thinks her boyfriend's dead. Um, she, Dr. Dillman's essentially in a mental coma. Well, he's just a goat. <laughs> So she's literally lost everything, and she's like, I have nothing to lose, and every good thing I've done is hurt people. So she says, frick it. I'm gonna turn my boyfriend into a scarecrow. And it's really, like, intense, dark, and you feel the intensity and intention behind it. I like it. I love this song, and dude. It's Yes. And it's probably the darkest the show goes since the opening number. It's due to her I'm made of tin. Her spell made this occur. So for once I'm glad I'm heartless. I'll be heartless killing her. Well, then we're followed up with March of the Win Witch Hunters. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> now this song, I'm only bringing it up so we can talk about like how it's literally just about I want to murder the witch. Who doesn't want to murder the witch, though? I mean, have you seen her? She's green. <laughs> And um, <laughs> Bach, a.k.a. the Tin Man's line about blaming her for being tin. I think Bach is the most unlikable character in the entire show. He's a he's an incel. Say what you want about the wizard, like, but, you know, he's at least got, like, some personality to him. Bach is just like, I'll never get the girl I really want. <laughs> but he has, like, the most darkest gruesome line in the entire show it's due to her i'm made of tin her spell made this occur so for once i'm glad i'm heartless i'll be heartless killing her yeah it really it's it's very negative towards the tin man hashtag not my tin man not my tin man yes <laughs> he was just a nice gay man who wanted to help dorothy he just wanted to help dorothy for real, though, like, the Tin Man in uh, in The Wizard of Oz was very nice, if I remember right. Yeah, he was fine. He was fine. Uh, uh, this show fucking disgraces the good name of Jack Haley. Disgraced the Tin Man. song i want to talk about is for good what did you think about for good um uh, wait wait which song was this the song between alphaba and glinda before alphaba decides to die oh hey, it's all right this is the last song that andrew and i are gonna sing when we decide it's gonna be our last podcast we're gonna sing this at each other yeah fucking right dude i'm gonna sing fucking wonderful and walk out <laughs> Dance my way the fuck out, man. <laughs> it's because I'm, I'm going to be making my own podcast with <laughs> hookers and booze. That's the title. Forget the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you think about For Good aside from It's Good? Um, Like, the moment itself is, like, somewhat emotional. But I think my thing is that Alphaba and... Glinda never seemed like they were really that close of friends. So it's I feel kind of like they made up moment. way too fast in that moment. Yeah, it's like... Well, number one, they became friends because Glinda was a bitch <laughs> and gave her an ugly hat, and Alphaba was so clueless that she didn't realize that that's what happened. And that's how they became friends. And then really... Nothing else happened that made them want to be friends, really, other than that. So it's kind of just like a weird friendship. Well, we can't all come and go by Bubble. Where did you learn to do that? They're vague about it. <laughs> <laughs> did the wizard teach you that? I mean, the wizard doesn't know any magic, so probably not. <laughs> it might be just like Oz science. All right. Well, I think we talked about every song I wanted to talk about. All right. That's about all for the song. Andrew, for our last topic before we wrap this up. Out of all the music or out of all the stories in the world, 
what would you want to wickedify? Like, here are either the villain or a smaller character's backstory of why he really did the actions he did. I think I'd want to go with something where the villain is, like, really irredeemable. Mm-hmm. Like, and have it make, have them make sense with it. Like, what would you be thinking? What would you think, Jess? Like, what, what what's your idea while I'm trying to think of one? I would like to see Nightmare Before Christmas, but from Oogie Boogie's point of view. <laughs> He's just this guy that wants to eat. <laughs> He's homeless. Yeah, like, why does he have to, why does he gotta live out, like, why is he an outcast? What the fuck? Yeah, it's not fair. I mean, my go-to with the whole Wicked thing is is just fucking Gaston, please. Just because I want a musical where Gaston is the main character. But that's just because I like Gaston. <laughs> I would also watch one with the, of the disaster artist, but you hear from Tommy Wiseau's point of view. Tommy Wiseau is not the villain in that, though. He 100% really. is the villain of the disaster artist. But it, it ends with his happy ending, though. So, yeah. So does no. the Godfather. Yeah, and the God the Godfather's not the villain in the Godfather either. Fair. He so you really can't wickedify something like like you couldn't do the Godfather because it already is like he's already the the protagonist. You know what? I would like to see Silence of the Lambs from Buffalo Bill's point of view. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Where he's just trying to help this girl and everyone's just misconstruing things. He literally just kidnaps her. <laughs> no, she comes to his house. She's like, can I please have some food? And then the house caves in and he's like, oh God, I don't know how to get you out of that hole. I only have this rope that goes straight down to you, but it won't be able to hold your weight. Exactly. You're going to have to lose weight. You're going to have to lose some weight. I do also want to say that it looks very dry down there, so here's some lotion. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be in my room trying on these uh, skin suits that are not made of real skin. Oh my god, there's actually some skin down there in the basement? Throw it up here, we'll send it to the authorities. <laughs> I don't understand what I'm doing wrong. Then Clarice just barges in, and he's like, "Oh, come on in. Let's take a look." She all just all the lights, shooting. all the lights, all the lights go out, and he's like, "Oh, jeez, oh, the, the power went out. I gotta get my night vision goggles so I can help her get out of my house." <laughs> I would watch this fucking movie. <laughs> I think you can already watch it. It's uh, it's called uh, Tucker and Dale vs. Evil. That uh, that's a good choice. Have you thought of another one? I can't think of another one, but how about just Tucker and Dale vs. Evil, the musical? I'd watch that. I would watch that, too. All right. Uh, I can't really think of one. I'm going to go with Beauty and the Beast, because I want to see Gaston as the main character. Please, for the love of God, he's so amazing and sexy. And uh, Jesus Christ, I just want him all over me. <laughs> Oh, boy. <laughs> Andrew, what is your overall thoughts about Wicked and your cheese rating? Oh, what's my overall thoughts on Wicked? Um, I feel like people are going to think I was being critical of it. I, I, I actually did really like it. Uh, very positive. Um, it's just more fun to talk about stuff you didn't like versus stuff you did. But it, it was very good. Uh, <laughs> I recommend it to everybody uh, as a cheese rating. I'm going to give it, I don't know, it's really not that cheesy. In some sections it is. Hmm. I'm going to give it provolone just for the fuck of it. You know what you should have given it? What should I give it? Um, Shabizigur. What's that? A traditional cheese exclusively produced in the Canton of Glorus in Switzerland. It is green. Oh my god. Okay, I'm changing it. I'm giving it that. I don't know how to say it, though. It's Shaz... S-C-H-A-B-Z-I-G-E-R. Uh, Shazbot. Really? No. Oh, Jess, I have a special segment that we need to do. What? I have something in my fridge that I need to try, and I haven't tried yet. Oh, yes! Yes! I forgot! 
for those of you longtime watchers of our show, might remember our She Loves Me episode featuring Musical Hell that I mentioned chocolate cheese and both Andrew and Christy looked at me like I was a f- fucking idiot. Yep. And you know what? Just to prove a point, I bought Andrew some of that chocolate cheese. My goodness, this is a weird texture to this thing. And Andrew I'm has it in front of him right now, and he's about to eat it on on podcast for you. Yeah. I got a pretty good lump of it, so I'm really hoping I like it. Me too. <laughs> All right. It feels more like chocolate than cheese, to be honest with you. Like, it feels like it's going to melt. Let me give it a try here. That is very, very interesting. What's it taste like? Fudge. It tastes like fudge. But it's cheese. It says so. It does say it's cheese, but it tastes like straight fudge. I don't taste any cheese. But it is cheese. Yeah, it definitely is. It says it right on the fucking packaging. But it doesn't have the cheese flavor. Like, it obviously isn't fudge, and like you can, I can feel it, and it's not actually... So what would you rate that cheese experience? I think the problem isn't that, not, that it doesn't taste enough like cheese. Like, I actually want it to taste more like cheese, which is the weird thing. Well, that was uneventful, and I'm sorry for wasting your time with it. I think what, I want, what I'd want is I want to have it with something. See, I've had it with pretzels, like, and it works pretty well with that. Yeah, I think this with like with pretzels or something like that would work really well. I think the issue is eating it on your own. It's like if it's like if I had a block of fudge in front of me and I just started munching into it. It's like I guess some people do do that, but to me that seems like a really fucking weird thing to do. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for listening to our show. We're so thankful that you're here. Please review us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, at Musicals with Cheese. We're still doing contests. Like, not next week, but the following week we will be offering another contest. So get your reviews in. We're on Twitter at Cheesy Musicals. Our Instagram, Musical with Cheese. YouTube page, Musical Theater Lives. Shoot us an email at musicaltheaterlives at gmail.com. Our title card was created by Jolene Casco. And her Instagram is at Jolene Casco. Hit us up with some donations uh, if you'd like. Uh, Patreon.com slash uh, Musicals with Cheese. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Please, if you've got any free change to throw at us every month or whatever we post a podcast, we'd love to have it. We need to keep food on the table. We'd like to get Andrew out of the sales business. Yeah, if we can start doing our podcast in a, maybe not full time, but as more of a, less of a hobby and more of a job, I guess is how you'd put it. Yes, and if there are rewards for you where you'll get to talk and interact with us as well, like if we get enough funding, we'd be able to put out two of these episodes a week, so it's more content for you. Hang on, I'm about to try chocolate cheese, but I'm going to use like cheese crackers as like a as like a sandwich. Uh, Hang on. Mmm. See, that's good. That's actually if you add more cheese to the chocolate, then it's better. I kind of like that, actually. I'm kind of digging that. Andrew, do you want to talk about our official sponsor and cap it all off? Oh, wonderful. Audible is wonderful. <laughs> and if I had to go to get my audiobooks, I'd go to audibletrial.com slash musicals with cheese. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm very happy about our sponsor who has decided to sponsor us, and that is Audible. Uh, I actually have used Audible to uh, listen to books since I am illiterate. <laughs> uh, I do actually require the audio audiobook experience. Um, so this is a great service that we are going to be giving you a 30-day free trial membership for. All you have to do is go to audibletrial.com slash musicals with cheese, and you can check out just a huge selection of books that you can listen to, um, in- including uh, uh, Wicked, if you'd like. You can even listen to that on there. Uh, it's really that easy. Just go to audibletrial.com slash musicals with cheese, and you'll not only get some free books, but you'll uh, be supporting the show. Yes. Thank you guys for listening. I'm so happy that you guys keep listening in. I'm Jesse McAnally. And I'm Andrew DeWolf. And this was Musicals with Cheese. Mm-hmm.